Hello and welcome to the Santa Cruz Symphony's digital series, Symphony at Home. I am so excited this afternoon to welcome two of the most special guests, assistant principals of our second violin and viola section. Some of the most exciting, compelling, uh, accomplished musicians I know, the Nguyen Vanji duo, Jill Vanji and Rochelle Nguyen. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us, Danny. Thank you, it's a pleasure. One of my favorite things from the last year is your collaborations and you're bringing this new musical chamber ensemble into, you know, to life together. You being such incredibly accomplished musicians and playing with so many different orchestras, different chamber ensembles, but what you brought together as a duo, I think is compelling, so inspiring in the most direct way. The way you framed your videos outside of your house and different parks and it just speaks so directly to these found musical experiences that I think can be so meaningful in life. But I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how this duo came to be. Well, Rochelle and I have known each other for a few years now. We actually met playing chamber music. And soon after you started playing with the Santa Cruz Symphony, we were playing a string quartet performance. And actually with Nigel Armstrong, he was part of our foundation as a chamber music group. Um, I found out that Rochelle needed a place to live. And I said, there's a unit available in my building. Here's my landlord's number. And she called them and moved in the next week. <laughs> yeah. So we've been neighbors and colleagues for a few years now. Yeah, and I've been so grateful to have Jill right next door. Um, it is what allowed us to continue playing music in a time when you know, unfortunately, a lot of people have not been able to get together to gather and play music. Um, we're, we're fortunate to have each other so close by and um, to get along and, and play well together and to have a space to, um, to create these short little videos that a lot of, hopefully, our fans have, have seen. If people have been following our videos, another thing that you can tell that you know, brings us together is our pets. We try and feature our pets <laughs> on our videos. Um, Jill has two cats named Artemis and Captain Spectacular. And um, my dogs, Annie and Noodle, uh, are, are often featured. So perhaps some of our fans are, are into our pets as well. But that's, <laughs> that's another thing that I think um, solidifies our, our musical <laughs> bond. We had played together as a duet partnership a couple of times before the pandemic. We were putting on fuller concerts and then the pandemic happened. And we thought, wouldn't it be adorable if we were playing our instruments outside our windows and filming this duet together? And it turned into sort of a Romeo and Juliet kind of moment. I was up in my apartment <laughs> and you were down, <laughs> down in the yeah. driveway uh -huh. playing the music up towards me and I was responding. And it was just adorable and fun. And we thought, let's keep doing these. Let's do one a week for the whole pandemic, although we did not think the pandemic <laughs> would go on this long. We've also um, challenged ourselves to memorize all of the pieces that we played in those videos, um, which even, I mean, before the pandemic, I was not accustomed to memorizing anything at all. So that was a challenge that we, we put on ourselves because we thought it would enhance the cuteness of the videos and make it more of a challenge yeah when you're in orchestra and you have 90 minutes of music to play you can't really memorize it all memorizing one minute of music to play together and maybe involve a dog or two <laughs> is a fun way to spend some time together it's a great time for all of us <laughs> to, to watch that and to experience it thanks to your sharing it it's wonderful that you're representing this kind of musical liberating experience. It's so immediate, you know, it really is a, a delight in the relationship to, to the music and to the, to the performance that way. I love how this has led to you're promoting other people's works and commissions and, you know, it led to more musical directions than where it necessarily started from. So I'd love to hear more about that. Halfway through the pandemic or so, we just got interested in playing music that you know, people haven't heard before, um, and particularly pieces by um, underrepresented composers. I especially find joy in performing pieces by women composers because we are both women. So that's become important to us in everything that uh, we program 
from now on. So. And we started doing live streams last summer. <laughs> so we started off with the Warhorse duos, sort of. There are a couple by Mozart, another by Martineau, the Handel Halverson. So we started off with the Warhorse duos. There are a couple by Mozart, another by Martineau, the Handel Halverson. Then we thought, wouldn't it be great to just play music that even we haven't heard before? We also want to challenge ourselves and any listeners to rarely heard pieces. And then, of course, all the living composers there's a piece that we're playing now by Derek Spiva that was originally written for any two instruments. And we'll take it. <laughs> we're excited to play anything experimental and new that might not be heard otherwise. When I um, inquired about his music, he was more than happy to share. We also played a piece by Alexandra Bryant. She listened in to uh, one of our rehearsals. So it's, it's another exciting thing about, about uh, playing new music getting to correspond and work with you know, Derek Spiva and, and Alexander Bryant and these people who are, are very eager to share their music. I'm wondering if uh, Derek Spiva's piece, if you could help describe what it sounds like, what it feels like to you as performers who our audience is gonna get to hear and enjoy. I think it has a very exotic sort of feeling. There are also some semi-improvisational parts which sound a little bit jazzy. There's a lot of pointillistic, I would say, rhythms. Then it just comes right back to the intensity at the end. He has a lot of formal training in, in different music from all around the world. He's studied African dance music, music from India, and so he's, he has a lot of compositional training in very different styles. The protest song, We Shall Overcome, it's been done so memorably in so many different contexts. And I'd just love for you to share with us what it means to you. Our version of We Shall Overcome is maybe simpler than some of the other ways that have been done recently. And maybe as a result, it's very personal, sort of like hymnal. That's what it means to me. When we were making a video every week last summer, there were all the Black Lives Matter and protests. We went to a protest in Sunnyvale to show support. We wanted our video to reflect our own personal support. So we filmed We Shall Overcome in the framework of Black Lives Matter, but also in the framework of the pandemic, knowing that this time in life is temporary and we have the power to push through and make things a better time again. And it feels very refreshing, yet solemn, to play that beautiful short verse of We Shall Overcome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I, uh, what it means personally to you, because uh, to me, hearing that in the context of Black Lives Matter, and that being the first thing that I thought of even before pandemic associations, which so obviously relevant as well, is so profoundly important. And I thought, uh, you know, sometimes these most simple forms, the, the power is even more poignant, more direct than just this, the combination of two sympathetic supporting voices is, is so s symbolic itself and uh, shows the power of the individual, the individual of cooperation and the individual the importance of solidarity and of compassion and of the moment that we're in and for speaking out and using our voices. It just shows the relevance of the statements of artistic support that we can make. We've been very appreciative of all of our, our, um, our listeners and our, our fans all over uh, the country and, and the world. 
We too are very thankful to have people listen to our music. We, musicians aren't, um, aren't much without people to listen to, to what we're playing, so we're thankful for our audiences. You know, there are friends that I haven't spoken to in years that I've reconnected with because of this. We usually get our, our biggest response out of any videos that have the dogs in them. We've got some silly videos and definitely a lot of silly bloopers involving the dogs. And there's always someone that reaches out and says, oh, the one with the dogs was my favorite one. Please make more with the dogs. <laughs> one of the videos, the dog rodeo, what, that was probably one of the most fun things we've recorded together. And I was so proud of, of Annie in that video. I shared it with dog groups that I'm a part of. They didn't sign up to necessarily to watch our music, but there was also you know, an outpouring of, oh, thank you for the music or what great music. And, and also, you know, love for, for my dog, which of course I, <laughs> I'm biased, but I think she's amazing. <laughs> it's just been a great way to connect because I'm, I'm otherwise not very um, outward facing on social media, but these videos have, have been something that I've looked forward to sharing and, and have really enjoyed hearing that people also enjoy them. I know all pet lovers go crazy to see <laughs> those little show stealers, I mean, or scene stealers, they, they really are. The cats unfortunately don't really appear on video. These silly videos have been sort of a nice snapshot or like a diary for this time. Normally we spend our time practicing away on symphonic repertoire and really digging into the work of it all. I think our videos will just be fun for our families to f see in the coming years. I'm hoping to show my niece and nephew these silly <laughs> videos. Uh, I'm wondering if you could share just some favorite musical memories that you've had with the orchestra and your time together. Well, one of the greatest concerts we played together was actually the fiddle fantasy Noah Bendix Balgley and the Mahler 4 performance. We got to play in that together and that was just such a great concert to put together. The Mahler is incredibly moving and fun to play and Noah's piece was just so energetic and also a lot of fun to play, but you really just want to sit there and listen to him. <laughs> and that's a concert that we've remembered fondly together. That's probably my most memorable concert experience playing in the Santa Cruz Symphony is that concert with them, that incredible, incredible violin concerto. Noah just emanates this fun that he's having as he's playing and, and it was just a joy to be a part of that. One of the things that I really enjoy about playing in the Santa Cruz Symphony is the programming. Like, I think my first year here, we did Dvorak 9 to open the season and Beethoven 9 to finish the season. So there are these awesome standards that we get to play, but you always like to ask us to loosen up a little bit, um, ask the audience to try something new, like Noah's piece, um, the Lou Harrison that we did a few years ago, and my personal favorite was Frankenstein. All the Esopeka Solonin is so intimidating to look at, but by the end of the rehearsal series, it's a joy to play and be able to listen to. It's really the intrepid musicians like you <laughs> who are to, to be thanked, and I think it's, it's so exciting to see the reaction from the community, and how much they enjoy uh, going along these adventures of new, new music like that along with those standards we all love. Symphonies don't have to be just backwards looking and I think the Santa Cruz Symphony really excels at just giving the audience a great mix, a taste from all different eras of this great repertoire. I'm so glad that Jill and I share the passion to play new music and to explore and push the repertoire. It's a real gift to find someone that you work really well with. We've been going out to Yosemite to play with some colleagues out there. Santa Cruz Symphony Concertmaster Nigel Armstrong and cellist Aaron Wong. That's also a group that loves 
beautiful standard repertoire and then pulling out some of the stranger things too. We should bring our mountain spirit down to the beach town. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, not everyone can be like Jill. <laughs> because it's so amazing to work with Jill. That is so sweet. And we work so well together and it, it um, it's a phrase that is often uttered in our house is, well, not everyone can be like Jill. Or, I wish everyone could be like Jill. <laughs> Rochelle actually has a background in science. She just comes from a totally different world of putting music together. She didn't stew in the sort of conservatory system where music is all you're allowed to think about. She has the most beautiful tone. Uh, if in her household she says like, I wish I could work with Jill all the time. In my household I'm always like, I wish I sounded like Rochelle. I've got my eyes on her all the time just to try to see what she's doing and to be exactly with her. That's fantastic. Your chemistry is so obvious and it, it creates such you know, immediately compelling and wonderful musical results. It just highlights the, the kind of you know, exceptionally accomplished artist that you are. Oh my goodness, Juilliard, Stanford, the science background, so much orchestral chamber music. You know, it's uh, luxury casting here. You two certainly have something Ex exceptional going on, so viva the duo. <laughs> Our life is really like a sitcom with <laughs> Rochelle and Cameron downstairs with their two hilarious rambunctious dogs <laughs> and Jill and Neil upstairs with their angry sullen cats. <laughs> How will these two ever come together to make a <laughs> duet happen? Stay tuned to find out. <laughs> Thanks for watching. We hope you've enjoyed and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye.